Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Nadapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And today we have a panel on the role of packaging in reducing food waste. Uh, it's a pretty interesting topic and I am quite excited about uh, listening to what the panelists have to say. Uh, the panel, the idea, topic idea, as well as the moderation is by Heis. Uh, this is the second panel he is moderating for us. If you have not seen the first panel, please head to the video panel section on our website and you will find it listed there. Uh, Heise's area of expertise are food and organic waste, plastics, sustainable packaging, sustainable smart cities, and metropolitan areas, refugee camps, change management, and entrepreneurship. Today, he is talking to Helen Williams, who's an associate professor at Cal State University, and Richard Swannell, who's a director of RAP Global. As usual, we will be taking questions from you. So please feel free to use either the chat, which you can see the chat box or the Q&A. And uh, Heist will ensure that the questions are posed to both the panelists. So yeah, I'm just gonna hand this over to Heist and uh, that's about it. Yes. Hi there. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, great to meet you all this afternoon. Well, at least here it's afternoon. And uh, today we're working on uh, on the role of packaging and reducing food waste. Uh, my name is Gijs Langeveld, and I'm really excited to host this one because today we have some great experts on the line, uh, Helen and Richard. Uh, so I will be introducing them more formally in a few moments. Uh, just one tip, if you're watching this live, you can use the chat feed and uh, just ask your questions or mark your comments during the presentations and we'll get back to them afterwards. Uh, so the topic of today is actually the challenge is how are we going to feed the world's growing population and reduce our climate impact. Reducing food loss and waste is a substantial part of the answer. In 2015, nations of the world adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, including a call for halving the rate of food loss and waste by 2030. So, at one of my projects, which I'm managing at the Knowledge Institute on Sustainable Packaging, we asked ourselves, to what extent is food packaging creating actually added value? Food packaging, on the one hand, protects the contents, ex extends shelf lives and shares product information, However, on the other hand, packaging also results in waste and litter. Uh, also, the end-of-life options, what are they doing? So today, we'll discuss this role and um, see what is needed to change towards a more sustainable society. So the first speaker I would like to introduce to you is Helen Williams. Helen is an Associate Professor in Environment and Energy System at the Karlstad University. And for the past 10 years, she has done research in the area of packaging and sustainable development. She is strongly committed to contribute to sustainable development. Hi, Helen. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for inviting me to this chat. Mm? Well, great. Great to have you here. So could you briefly introduce yourself, your background and your experience in food waste, please? Yeah. As you said, I've been working now with research for more than 10 years within the area, starting off from a packaging perspective because I used to work in the paperboard business before going back to the university and start my research projects. And of course then to start to view what about this, how to develop packaging that provides consumer to do better. So we have, I have done studies within the entire supply chain, but mainly look into retail and consumers and trying to understand how do they interact with food and packaging and how can we provide better solutions for them not to waste food? And also, of course, to be able to make it more intuitive how to sort and how to recycle packaging. Very, very interesting. So you've done uh, many research and uh, uh, about retail and consumers. And, and could you explain us a little bit about the role of packaging for resource efficiency in the value chain of food waste? What is packaging doing in that specific value chain? Yeah. Uh, from for a very long time a lot of researchers and scientists have focused on the on packaging itself to look uh, into the material and the environmental impact of different materials what we do is that we use 
a service perspective of packaging, meaning that we look more into the functions of packaging and more than the indirect effects of packaging. So what we uh, try to look at and want to look at is both what pa packaging functions uh, and what services they provide. Of course, the main function is to make it to protect the food. Uh, and then we have a lot of different functions that facilitate handling of consumer. It's both like opening, reclosing options, mm, making it easy to empty the packaging, and the most important of them all, to make sure that consumer can actually buy the right amount for their needs. And then we have also packaging provide different information and communication to the consumer both about the food, of course, but also about recycling of the packaging. And what we have seen is, of course, as you know, and many of us, that the food has such a high environmental impact. So it is so important and crucial to make sure that more of the consumed food, more of the produced food is actually consumed. And the more, uh, the larger impact you have of the product, like when we talk about meat or cheese and yeah, uh, makes it even more important to protect that food compared to packaging uh, soda water or <laughs> water and package that that in those type of products the packaging has the highest environmental impact and not the food so there there is a difference of course between different products and what you are packaging so so just to, to make one question about it you say it's not it's mainly about protection uh but what you said in a side sentence yeah. triggered me it's also about getting the right amounts uh, how, how does that link towards changes in our society i mean uh, we all live in different types of households what is the the, the role of packaging and, and dimensions in there yeah um that uh, I think we to a higher extent need to calculate, I mean, because if you make really large packages, you reduce the amount of packaging material per kilogram of product. But if you waste a lot of product, you can easily calculate that by using more packaging materials per kilogram of food, you can easily count that it is a good environmental strategy to do that not for all products but for a lot of products and especially the food products where you have invested more resources into the production and since we in in many european countries we have more households with one to two persons household we need to see to it are we offering the correct amount to the to many consumers because what we see in our household studies that a lot of consumer buy their products they're open the products and use some of it half of it or two thirds and the one third or the half of the products are left in the refrigerator and often forgotten which mm -hmm. means that they waste it in the end so we uh, it is you can do of course with information but what we have seen now in the latest studies, it's really to make sure that more people can buy the correct amount of food. And, and, and so, so that's one way that consumers are being helped in, in reducing their, their environmental impact of specific food items by, getting, by buying the right amounts. Do you have other types of how, waste package, uh, uh, how packaging helps consumers to act in a way that reduces environmental impact? For some products, it's also the reclosing options with packaging where you have uh, different kinds of sticky <laughs> packaging that recloses more easily and make the product uh, not to dry out uh, and to make it last for a little bit longer. Those options can also, where you can calculate, is it worth to use a little bit more of packaging material to, to provide for that function. And then you can calculate from an environmental point of view, is it worth to use these resources for a reclosing option, for example? And, mm -hmm. and that specific calculation, do you do that with the LCA or how do you do those calculations? We do that with LCA. So uh, look into the 
uh, environmental impact and mainly climate impact, I have to admit, because of there is more data out there on climate impact, both for different packaging formats, but also for different food items. So to, to use LCA and to calculate that, that's been one of our main contributions, I think. Great, great. And could you explain a little bit about uh, those, uh, your LCA methodology and uh, how do you actually measure negative effects like, like uh, for example, plastic packaging in our oceans or current end of life options? Uh, how are they being part of, are they being part of the LCA and how do you measure these types? One thing you can do is that you calculate from consumed food instead of produced food so you get the 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 inside yeah some numbers about the amounts that people are wasting so you get those number into the lca from the beginning another thing that we do is that we work with the scenario techniques like if if consumer waste these amounts and you invest in a little bit more packaging like if you if you make a smaller pack of something a more portion pack that means that you are increasing the amount of packaging material with 30 percent and if we are increasing the amount of packaging material with 30 percent how much food loss would that respond to what is the equal climate impact of the the food loss and then you can theoretically calculate the impact of the food waste versus the packaging material. Okay, great. Um, how, how do you see like negative effects like uh, which we mentioned before, um, uh, like uh, influencing or the litter or end of life? Um, what is your uh, view on how we can prevent these more and more in, in, in the future? How, how could we uh, uh, manage our packaging better in the chain to actually prevent the negative spillovers? Yeah, that's, uh, of course, I'm, I'm also following the research that is done both to, to measure the litter, how do we get um, better figures, numbers, to, so that we know more about how to address this into the LCAs. But, and, but what we have been doing is more that we try to understand how do we make consumers and people involved in this work, how do we make sure that they actually put the empty packaging in the right bin in the end? How, how, can, that, how can we make sure that more of the used packaging actually comes back into the recycling system? Because what we see is then when we have packaging that are a little bit too dirty, or packaging that makes the consumer uncertain. Uh, how should I sort this? Do I have to make it clean? All of these uncertainties will direct more packaging to the waste bin instead of the recycling bin. So we need to understand that and um, yeah, be better in the design and the communication so that more comes back. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, last question from my side. Um, uh, have you identified new packaging innovations which are entering the market now or which are already on the market which actually increase reduce the food waste dramatically in in the sense that well you say well these are examples which are actually uh, such a good example that we should learn from that yeah i th what i when we uh, go into a supermarket here in sweden and look at the different packaging there are, um, I think there are still few examples actually that I can talk about. There are initiatives to communicate in better ways, ways like it's not bad after the best before date. I, I'm sure you have seen different variety of those where you where where producers add a line like you can try this product after the best before date. So those examples exist. Uh, and I also think that for um beans and lentils that where you have the the paperboard solutions instead instead of the metal cans there are a larger variety of sizes today where you can see this is a smaller size more directed to single households and mm, those uh 
at least options where you have different sizes are, are interesting to, to see that they're coming up in the market. That's very interesting. Um, uh, before we, I go to comments from uh, the, the people, do you have anything that you would like to add to your story and say, well, to the webinar, like people, like this is an important point when you look at the role of packaging and reducing food waste? Uh, the most important role is actually to, to get a better idea of the consumer needs and provide better sizes because often it's like 500 grams or half, half a kilo or a kilo. It, it's too little knowledge and too little care that has been taken into the area of trying to figure out how much food do actually households need. That is one important area. And then for some products like a lot of dairy products uh, that are more, uh, that are more sticks to the product, we need to figure out better solution about how to make them easier to empty because a lot of, quite a lot of food is wasted for specific dairy products um, that we- oh, yeah. Well, can you give an example of a diary product which, uh, which is difficult yeah, to I would empty? say uh, the most common example that I, where I have measured in household, it's, it's the yogurt or sour. We have a lot of sour milk, sour, um, yeah, yogurt and sour milk products that are stuck to the, the, um, the inner surface of the packaging. So their producers could do better. Okay, very good. Well, I've got some comments of, of, the, of the audience and the first one is that, um, well, I use a lot of uh, bulk packaging instead of, um, of, of um, uh, and, and use my own reusable packaging. So uh, it's not really a question which is posed, but it's more like a comment. Uh, so, so is that something that should be a way forward which is more sustainable that we all use more uh, bulk packaging? Yeah, for, for some products where it's, it's dry and they last for a long time, that can be an option uh, for, for, many product, for many consumers also, I think. But where you have a very limited um, shelf life for fresh produce and uh, um, it's so important that the packages, when you take them to the, the store and reuse them, that they are clean, that you don't get any bad bugs with you or with the food. So I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of that in a sense for the fresh produce, uh, that we start to get more uh, of bacteria and um, uh, that people get sick or that the product don't last for a long time. Of course, if we, go back to a system where we buy everything by the day and we consume it in the evening and not store food at homes. And there we have more. Uh, so, so I think there will be in the future different shift. We will have more, some of that where we consume perhaps more by the day that we don't store the food. But I think we will also see some food that we transport longer distances and that we need to make sure that they are probably, <laughs> properly sealed and safe for us. I think we will see both in the future. Okay, cool. Um, so a second uh, uh, a point is that uh, picking the example of single-use plastics, uh, they would like to know what's your opinion regarding one single meal package, uh, food waste versus packaging waste. Uh, for, for, there are different studies out there showing the impact of the food and the impact of the packaging. And for a lot of products, the food have a higher climate impact uh, and not the packaging. So there are different measures and things you can do in order to make sure that all of the food is consumed. So it's, it's, it's so difficult to be general because it's so complex, but the higher impact you have, and if you have then a ready meal where you have added some meat or some cheese that has a high climate impact, uh, it means that you need to be even more sure to make yeah, to make sure that all of this food can be consumed in the end. Okay, and the um, third question, and then I go uh, uh, to our next speaker is, uh, do the LCAs also include the resources that went into processing, packaging, disposing of food? 
uh, that get recalled because of packaging mishaps, uh, like uh, uh, chicken nuggets, which are recalled. Is that part of the LCA as well? I would say recalls, when mistakes happen, those are seldom included in the life cycle assessment. Uh, and I haven't taken that into account in my life cycle assessments. Yeah, but it's only very seldom, as I understand. Right. Yeah, from the, I think from the big um, streams of food that you have, of course, there are occasionally recalls, but th those are not the big, <laughs> big amounts. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, I would like to move to our next speaker now, um, and I would like to introduce to you Richard Swano. And Richard is director of Rep Global, a business unit of a UK charity at the forefront of the circular economy. He joined Rep in 2004 and leading the team that created and delivered an innovative agreement between Rep and UK supermarket retailers to reduce packaging and food waste. And um, as I understand, Richard, you will be explaining more. So before you start, uh, please uh, briefly, briefly introduce yourself, your background and your experience in food waste. Oh, hello, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, so my name is Richard Swanell, um, and I've been working on uh, food waste and packaging reduction uh, since the early 2000s, um, particularly in terms of trying to work out how not only to help citizens in the home reduce food waste, but also to work out ways of reducing food waste right across the supply chain and optimizing packaging in that process. And currently I lead our work, which we undertake outside the UK, and currently we're working around 20 countries worldwide. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so um, wh why should be tackling food waste uh, should be one of our main priorities according to you? So I, I think the reason we should tackle food waste is just the sheer scale of the, the challenge. So for example, the, the, you know, what we know about food waste is, is that around a third of all food produced on the planet is wasted. So every, basically for every two tons we consume, one ton is wasted. And that's costing us a significant amount of money, about $940 billion globally, which is around twice the turnover of Walmart. Um, but also, uh, it's also costing a lot in environmental terms. And you know, Helen's already said a little bit about this, but you need the area the size of China to grow the food that is currently thrown away. Um, and also, it's also this is a, it's against a backdrop of one in nine people going to bed every night hungry. So clearly this is something we have to work out. But in CO2 terms alone, it is 8% of greenhouse gas emissions are associated with food loss and waste. If that was a country, it would be the third biggest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet. Yeah, yeah, eight percent. That's a lot. Well, that figure still uh, uh, is uh, jumping in my mind like uh, it's huge. Um, so, uh, um, according to you, is there a business case for food waste reduction? So, what I'd like to do for the business case of MA is just to is just to use a slide. Would that be helpful? Uh, just to yeah, show, yeah, yeah sure. to show, just to show um, exactly. So, if I just um, uh, share the screen. And um, here we go. And yep, yeah, and share. Brilliant. And so, great. We can see it. So, Justin, this is a piece of research that we did with uh, the World Resources Institute (WRI), and we looked at 1,200 business sites around the world. That's 700 companies in 17 countries. And what we did in each of those cases is we we looked at exactly what it cost businesses to tackle to reduce food loss and waste, and then the financial benefits that they accrued from actually reducing those food loss and waste. And the results were quite even surprised us who've worked in this area for quite a while. The median return on investment was for every $1 invested, you were getting $14 back. Now that's quite skewed if you look at the, the profile. Actually most were getting, most businesses were getting uh, between about one and uh, um, between one and twenty dollars back for every one dollar invested but even so there was an awfully long tail which shifted the median a bit. Bottom line is wherever we've looked mostly reducing food loss and waste makes financial sense. And I guess one of the questions you might ask yourself as a result of that is why if, the, if there's such a compelling case for reducing food loss of waste, there isn't more of it going on around the world. 
and we think this is the reason, is that most businesses get an invoice which is actually for disposal of food waste i take it away and burning it or taking it away and putting it into a hole in the ground that's the visible cost whereas the true cost of waste is what helen was talking about it's the you know the growing the food it's transporting the food it's packing the food it's the energy cost the labor cost the water cost all of those costs which actually depending on the country in is between 10 times and 20 times the cost of disposal and so it's this un un understanding the true cost of waste which is critical to understanding why businesses perhaps aren't doing this more bottom line is reducing food loss and waste makes business sense oh yeah very good and and but saving those costs uh, i can if i would uh, would be digging into such a business case like like you do is that a specific savings also like if i'm a company and would invest in that is that savings coming to me or is it going to a other stakeholder uh, other partner in the chain the value chain now, in this particular piece of research, there are the savings that accrue directly to the businesses concerned, although you're quite right. I mean, we've done work in this looking across the, uh, the, the, the food supply chain for particular products where we actually have found not only does investment in one part of the supply chain reduce waste for that part of the supply chain, but it can deliver benefits up and down the supply chain in that process. So looking for those systemic solutions is also key and something that we've done as part of our voluntary agreements like the Courtauld Commitment. Well, very interesting this, very, very interesting. So, um, uh, leaving the business case, I'm not sure whether I pronounce it right, but the Courtauld Commitment, uh, which is an agreement uh, with the UK supermarkets and retailers. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about this commitment and what was it about or is it about and how does it reduce food waste? Yeah, great. No problem. So I've got a few slides that help illustrate this, but it's called the Courtauld Commitment because actually the very first meeting was held back in 2005 in the Courtauld Gallery in London, where we negotiated with retailers this idea of working together to reduce both packaging and food waste. Um, and in essence, it can be summarized in this straightforward way. What we're trying to do with business is agree everybody targets um, food waste and then measures exactly what food waste they've got and then acts upon that measurement and therefore Courtauld 2025 which is the latest version of that process is actually trying to put the UK on trajectory towards halving food loss and waste by, 20, uh, by 2030 in line with the SDG 12.3. But how do we do this? Well, what we look to do is basically a simple five point plan. The first three are basically around um, uh, preventing waste in the first place, reducing food loss and waste through the target measure act approach. But when you have surplus food that's edible, redistribute that to those in need as far as you can, and then divert as much of that of the products to um, when you can back into the food system, if you at all possible, um, to value added products to make the best value of it. And then that's not strictly targets within Courtauld, but we also encourage those signatories to recycle as much of their food loss and waste as possible either to composting or ad for example and minimize the amount that goes to landfill and thermal treatment and it's interesting that nearly all of the signatories uh, to the court of commitment are now zero waste to landfill as part of that process but just to give you a bit more detail about how this works is what we're really about is to try and focus on the hot spots within the food system and drive uh, systemic change uh, within that process. Um, and by understanding where waste arises and what causes it, and then you can look at solutions that you can then share across all the signatory base so that people can uh, rapidly change and critically to encourage behavior change across the system where businesses are thinking not only am I about reducing food loss and waste in my own premises but I'm also helping my customers and my suppliers reduce food loss and waste and just to give you a bit more detail around this uh, because it sort of brings up the packaging angle is if you take an example and this is an example for um, from a hotel in the north of England where we trace back right through the supply chain working with everybody in it what what about happens in, in terms of food waste so if you take 100 potatoes two um, were lost in the field they weren't actually picked up in the first place nine were lost with grading and that was interesting because the grading numbers had the grading sizes hadn't been challenged for a while and possibly by re-looking re at what was acceptable you could actually get more potatoes through simply by changing the diameter that's acceptable three were lost in storage but 17 were lost in packaging and transportation and there it shows there was clearly an issue here where innovative packaging could come in and preserve the potatoes and make sure more got through to the uh, to the hotels concerned 
Nine then went off in the kitchen, 20 were lost in preparation because this particular kitchen was very focused on producing a lot of French fries or chips and weren't uh, that good at doing it. Um, and then because of portion sizes, going back to Helen's point, uh, being too large, another 15 were left on the plate. The critical thing is not so much the numbers, but the analysis, because what the analysis does is show you where you can focus to get your biggest uh, possible impact. And also it shows the role of packaging can play in that process, but it does show you there are multiple things you can do across the supply chain to drive change. Very, very interesting and uh, uh, a clear story. Um, you were mentioning one slide before that you're focusing on hotspots. Could you explain a little bit more about what kind of hotspots that you focus on? Yeah, so what we've done in, in the example on, the, on your screen shows it for potatoes and the hotspots there, you can clearly see the ones with the biggest numbers. We've done this, uh, for example, in, um, in the beef supply chain, we've done it in pork, we've done it in dairy, we are, um, we've done it in fruit and veg. And what you do is by looking across the supply chain, you look for where you're going to get the biggest uh, opportunity to reduce food loss waste and then focus on those opportunities. And there, for example, packaging changes could be part of the solution to reducing food waste in that area. Okay, great. Um, uh, so, um, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's, a, I think, a great commitment. Uh, it is a voluntarily agreement, as I understood it. Uh, have you encountered any limitations with your approach to what, because it's a voluntarily agreement to this? Um, and there are some limitations uh, to this particular approach. But first of all, let me just give you some indication of impact of this particular approach, because it can be quite significant. So if I just look across the last version of Courtauld, which is the third, we've now on our fourth iteration of Courtauld, but the third one actually you know, delivered 110 million euros within three years and increased the redistribution by 58 million meals and helped put the UK on the trajectory to reduce uh, food loss and waste by 200,000 tonnes per year. But also for us, what was a bigger benefit, and here's a picture of um, Wembley Stadium, um, but what it did is it also encouraged um, the retailers and manufacturers to help their citizens reduce food waste and support our Love Food, Hate Waste campaign. And that has actually helped citizens reduce household food waste by about a million tonnes per year, or saving about three billion pounds. And the reason I've got Wembley behind there is a million tonnes would actually fill the entire stadium right up to the brim with food waste every single year. But where you've actually got, um, if you've got, a, um, like you have in hospitality and food service, many small businesses as part of the supply chain. So you've got you know, tens of thousands of small hospitality and food service sectors, then getting them to sign up to a voluntary agreement and working together on the hotspots becomes much more challenging. And so what we've done there is we've developed something called the Guardians of Grub campaign, which is a behavior change campaign focused specifically on helping small businesses reduce food loss and waste across the supply chain and optimize their packaging in that process. So there, I think, you know, it's, is our voluntary agreements the be all and end all? No. Are there policy options that can make a difference? Certainly, yes, there are. And are there different approaches like uh, behavior change campaigns to make a difference? Yes, you can. And by all means, look that up on the internet because it's a really interesting campaign. Yeah, yeah. I, I love your title as well, Guardians of the Group. That's great. Um, well done. Um, so, uh, looking at this campaign, uh, can you explain a little bit more about what kind of approaches RAP has initiated more to reduce uh, packaging and food waste? Yeah, so um, what's, in, what's interesting is we've got three ways of doing this. So one is, is that packaging is a key part of court old commitment and exactly help in tackling some of those hotspots. The second actually is it's a key feature within the Guardians of Grub campaign to make sure that you get the right amount of packaging um, in order to preserve the food to get it to the kitchen and damage, but also in the right pack sizes, exactly as Helen was saying, to get the right pack sizes, not only works in the home, but also works in, in, in restaurants and uh, hotels and pubs. But the other thing we've done in this space to, to tie it up is actually our plastics packed, um, where we specifically have got together not only the retailers and manufacturers responsible for packaging in this space, but also the packaging manufacturers and also the waste management industry to try and help deliver a more circular approach to plastics right across the supply chain. So obviously this covers plastic packaging specifically. Um, and in there, by, we have some very ambitious targets by 2025 of getting 100% of plastic packaging reusable recyclable or compostable um, to eliminate uh, unnecessary single-use packaging 
um, to actually, in, and this is again building on what Helen said, try to encourage citizens and indeed the whole supply chain to recycle as much plastic as possible. We've got a target of 70% uh, by 2025 and we're about 47% at the moment to give you an idea. Um, and also um, in, in driving an increase in recycled content to an average of 30% right across plastics packaging, which is a very ambitious target. But what it does is it drives the market for recycled plastic uh, in order to be able to encourage more capture of materials, but also design of products that, to make them more recyclable in the first place. So for example, just being an example of that was an announcement even today that many of the major retailers are moving out of black plastic, um, 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 because particularly black plastic trays for things like ready meals um, uh, and to other colors because black plastic is very hard to recycle, but other colors are higher, uh, higher value and are easier to recycle back into plastic packaging. Okay, great. Sounds good. Um, so final question for me and then I will move over to the audience. Uh, can, have you identified any new packaging innovations right now which are on the market which, which reduce food waste? And, and uh, I think Helen did a great job in sort of uh, giving a sort of summary of the types of packaging that's out there, which is making a difference. I mean, I would just add, there's been a big shift, for example, in the UK to skin packs, for, for, for example, for, for protein, for meats and fish. Um, and in, indeed now, actually one particular retailer has now announced a, a fully recyclable skin pack. So skin packs are much, much less packaging. Uh, they preserve the product um, going right through to store quite well. And if it's 100% recyclable, that's even better in terms of delivering the change. So that, that's one example. I, I give you another example, which is an announcement actually by Arla, which is more about labeling on packaging. But Arla have now moved towards um, uh, a best before date on their milk products rather than a use by date. And the interesting thing there is that that then empowers citizens to consume after the best before should they wish to do so, um, because it's perfectly safe to do so. So labeling in that way makes a big difference. Great. Great, perfect. Well, thanks for your presentation. Uh, do you have any slides left or was this I, the last one? I have just one slide, which I just wanted to share with everybody, uh, which is what great. I think we, we must do, of course, in this process, is we really must unite in the food waste pie and packaging needs to play its solution, its, its role in, in delivering solution on reducing food loss and waste. Perfect. Well, great last slide. Thank you. So, um, uh, because we're now moving towards questions, yeah, perfect. Uh, let me see who was next on the, on the, on the list. Um, uh, questions to you specifically. Uh, I've got uh, one of Paul Venson, which is actually, I think, three questions behind each other. So, uh, uh, keep notice to this one. Reducing household food waste by 1 million tons and 3 billion costs is great. Uh, does that mean that the job is done or how much more uh, should households reduction uh, should we aim for to achieve and by when? Mm, that's a that's a great question. Um, so 1 million tons per year of edible food waste roughly is around 23% of the total amount of food waste produced in the UK. So therefore, actually just with the SDG 12.3 target of halving food loss and waste, we're not even yet halfway towards that target. And so I think in the first instance, we should, uh, we should target halving food loss and waste across the supply chain in line with 12.3, SDG target 12.3. And then I think ask ourselves, how much further can we go in order to get as efficient as possible? Because what we really want to do is to use every morsel of food that is grown because we're feeding, um, you know, we're going to feed an, an extra 2, 2.5 billion people by 2050. So the more we, we optimize the supply chain to reduce food loss and waste, the less land we'll have to uh, convert over to food production to feed that population. But also the less greenhouse gas emissions we're going to have associated with food production. We'll feed more people with less inputs. And that's critical. Yeah, great. Uh, so, and a second question is, uh, should producers and councils be working together to help citizens understand that good packaging can help food waste last fresher or longer? Yes, fresher for longer, which actually, which was also a campaign within uh, Love Food Hate Waste, as it turns out. Um, I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, and one of the things that uh, 
um, we've seen within the plastics pact is a, a lot more close working between the retailers, the manufacturers, um, um, and also the waste management industry. And separately, our um, Recycle Now campaign is also focusing very strongly on encouraging citizens to recycle more things more often. Um, like many uh, uh, Northern European countries, you know, we're a nation of, of recyclers, um, but we, there, there was still plenty more we can do. You know, we're only recycling about 45, 46, 47% of our plastics packaging. We can clearly do much more of that. And I don't know about you, but it, you know, when you're walking along the street and you sort of see plastic bottles on, on the street or uh, other packaging on the street, you think, what a waste. If we can only encourage that material to go back into the economy, that's going to reduce greenhouse gas emission and indeed create jobs in the process. Okay, clear. So uh, let me open the floor for, for uh, to, to both of you, and, uh, and I still have some questions left. So one of the questions specifically for you, Helen, was um, that the UK government is driving for consistency and recyclability of packaging. Um, it's a recent resources and waste strategy. And the question is, how do you align this with the use of innovative packaging like resealable packs, which may not be easily recyclable? Oh, that, that is a tricky question, how you should do the different scenarios and calculate, like if you, if you do a really uh, advanced pack that where you use a very um, limited amount of resources, but it's more tricky to recycle versus to, to use, uh, for example, a plastic packaging where you use more material because you often need to use more if you don't use multi-layer packages that is then easier to get into the recycling scheme and there of course you need to calculate and that's very contextual in some countries where you sort more and get more back you it might be better to use a little bit more material to make sure that it's yeah that it can be recycled but in other countries and contexts perhaps it's better to use a really thin packaging uh, more multi-layer but that can be used for combustion and energy recovery so i the salute and that's the tricky part you need to be very contextual to realize which which packaging solution should we uh, yeah go for in this country and it's also then product specific, specific because uh, a food item with a very high impact uh, from the production, you need to do better with the packaging to make sure that more can be consumed. So it, mm, it's, uh, it's very complex. Yeah, yeah, I understand, I understand. So another question for you, I, th I presume, is that what for was, for example, the source of loss due to packaging and transportation of the, well, I think this question, well, uh, sorry, this refers to an example, but I, I'm not sure which example it uh, refers to. So let me head to the next question. Uh, why is it so difficult to make regulatory enforcement to make date labels clearer? Uh, these are behavioral nurtures which have been shown to enforce favorable behavior. Is that a question which yeah. you can answer, Helen? I don't know why it is that difficult, but I also think that the, pre the manufacturers, the brand owners are very, mm, or a bit conservative sometimes. I'm surprised that they are not showing more initiatives and doing more in the communication area because I mean retailers, I know from Sweden that the cu cucumber with plastic has been one of the most questioned products and consumers yeah. really have been really upset about why do you use this plastic on cucumber? For me, it's still a mystery why the more of the retailers not have signs saying a cucumber with plastic lasts six days longer or why they haven't put some more on the, uh, perhaps tried to make some printing or something to, to talk about these matters, but there are very few initiatives. Uh, so I'm, I'm surprised that the brand owners and the manufacturers themselves are not trying out more with consumers, how to communicate in new ways. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, as I'm, I'm not sure if there should be policy makers forcing them to do that. I'm surprised that they are not building their brands 
and showing that they take responsibility and thinking in these complex matters. Yeah. Very good, very good. Richard, do you want to comment? Yes, if I, just to add to that, um, what's really interesting about this space is this is an area where there's been a lot of um, uh, information campaigns for a while, but I, you know, getting the message across is, is always difficult. And one of the things that's happened recently is some innovations where some uh, retailers are actually selling particularly um, long life products like spaghetti and rice past their best before date which is getting people into the habit of thinking, ah, okay, so these are safe to consume after the best before, date, even though they're heavily discounted. So that provides value to consumers, but also there are actually businesses setting up on the internet now, which will sell food past its best before date. And again, it's getting into the culture, the fact that best before date is exactly what it says. And I think in Norway they had best before and it's fine afterwards as a, as a particular campaign within, within stores. So this is the whole point of getting it across. And the other thing to just remember, of course, is, is used by but you know I, I know plenty of examples in um, in households when we've done household research that people have thrown food away before the end of this the use by just to be absolutely sure they're being safe and yet it's perfectly okay to freeze products right up to midnight on the use by date so again getting those messages across is good in terms of reducing food loss and waste in the home but also in optimizing it down the supply chain as well Okay, cool. I've got here uh, two questions about uh, upcycling and reusable packaging. I, I, I'll take them together. Um, what are your thoughts about reusable packaging? Uh, uh, there are, it's, it's for sure discussed more and more with Loop, uh, for example, but uh, is, is, is that kind of packaging, can it be, uh, for, uh, and another question which relates to this is that upcycling rather than recycling, is that also possible with packaging? Um, what are your comments on reusable packaging and upcycling? Shall I? Um, if I have a good, because Helen's already ha uh, asked, answered this once, I'll, I'll, I'll just add to what Helen already said on this, which is um, that you know the 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 idea of reusable packaging has obviously been in the in the in the food industry for for quite a while, and where it may well have examples exactly as Helen said, is where you've got long life um, dry product, and there is a couple of stores. So Waitrose is part of the. Um, the plastic pact has, has uh, used its store in Oxford um, to actually start trialing various reuse options to see what works with uh, customers. Because the critical thing is, A, are you going to end up with more wastage in store by going down this particular route? And are you ending up with more wastage in the home or less wastage in the home because you can actually help yourself to the amount of product you actually want to buy rather than being dictated to by particular pack sizes? So I think, uh, I think that it, this is an area where there is scope to do more but I think we need to research it carefully to make sure we don't lead to unintended consequences because it comes back to Helen's point this is about a net environmental benefit solution is what we're looking for one that means as an that, that we're reducing the impact of the food system and not merely just in, in you know, putting in an, uh, a solution um, and hoping it works we need to be really clear that it actually ends up with less environmental impact because it's overall less waste I also know of a project here in Sweden where they are doing ready-made meals within reusable packs. So when the consumer have bought a lunch, for example, they can take the packaging back and they take the responsibility of cleaning it and making sure that it, it doesn't, yeah, that it is clean and safe again and then re use it for another lunch. And those examples are, of course, interesting to look at and as Richard said the that we reduce the net, in, net impact of the the system in the system. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee any any potential reusable systems for liquids? Um, there are um, there are reusable systems for liquids. In fact, actually, um, interestingly, in the Suetro store, they're looking at some of those. RAP's done some research, and you can find it on our website of a variety of 
um, for example, reusable pouches um, for detergents. And that's not strictly food, um, but it is a similar uh, uh, concept where you might have a machine in store which dispenses into a, into a pouch which has got a, a good seal on it, which you can then take home and then you can bring it back and refill. There are those options and they can have significant environmental benefits. They also require significant investment. So the critical thing is uh, trialing them in store and making sure they work not only for the supply chain, for the retailer, but also for the citizen as well. Because, you know, what you need to do is to be able to make sure that citizens can bring back packaging, because this is a whole new behavior change. I mean, we've only recently got into habit of actually reusing our own carrier bags. Now we're thinking about people bringing not only carrier bags back to store, but also packaging back to store, which they have to clean in advance, as Alan said. So we, we, we just got to make sure that this, this can work. But are there solutions? Yes, there are. Um, you know, it's just making sure that they work. Very good. Um, well, now I'm talking to you. Uh, I got the question more clear. Uh, thanks, Ariel, uh, for uh, 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 spelling it out to me. Uh, the example that Ariel meant was the example of the 100 potatoes in the hotel. So there's a question about to you, Richard. Uh, could you explain uh, what is the loss due to inadequate packaging or which other factors played a role there? Uh, um. hmm. Yeah, so in that particular supply chain, and, and you know, the key thing here is it's the analysis. It's that systemic approach to identifying the hotspots that was key about that example. But in that particular example, it was just that the, um, the packaging didn't protect the potatoes sufficiently well and there was more bruising than it needed to be. So there was a combination, the solution there was improved packaging um, uh, as part of that process, but it was also uh, looking at the logistics in the supply chain so we could min minimize the damage to the potatoes in that context, because potatoes are particularly prone to bruising. So it is, it is just making sure that, well, what it was was saying, ah, there's a problem here, let's go into the supply chain and work out what the packaging solution and the logistics solution can be to reduce that. Okay, clear. Got uh, a question about um, plastic stickers on apples mm. in retail. Um, there's already solutions to stop this with the branding and identification. And the question of Diederik is, why are food tattoos not yet seen in any supermarkets? Um, and um, uh, while well, these uh, stickers are disturbing on composting processes of waste food. Do, do you know anything about this, Helen or Richard? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've seen, I've seen more products now that have these, yeah, what did you call it? The tattoos. Tattoos uh, on some products. So they, it seems that they are working. Um, but it's the, they are a bit tricky to to see and I know from the retail when people take different apples and go and and weigh them there are a lot of cheating especially if you have organic fruit and consumer tend then when they go to and measure and weigh to take a cheaper apple instead of the organic apple and so there are yeah how to to make sure that consumer pay the right numbers and yeah I've, it is tricky and complex uh, I, and i'm not really i don't know about the different stickers that's not my i don't know that much okay. about that. Mm. And, and if I just might add to that, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on on stickers, uh, so and I do know I do know they're an issue in composting and in AD as well, um, although they can be removed. I think the interesting thing is this is again some of the things that's being happened as part of the plastics pact is trying to find alternatives um, to this to try and see if there's a, if there is a a low cost um, one with minimum uh, amount of packaging solution that enables um, you know people to buy accurately what is on the shelf and particularly when you've got a lot of loose uh, loose products sold identification becomes really important so i know that is is is, is a core thing that retailers are investigating at the moment okay very good i've got uh, a question which has been posed uh, 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 some time ago there's much unnecessary food snacks on our shelves according to ilse murphy uh, that use a lot of groundwater and packaging um, how could we make sure that more useful food products are produced rather than useful products? Hmm. 
You were talking about unnecessary food now, were you? Yeah, it says unnecessary food and snacks on our shelves. Yeah, I, th I think that that's a main issue that we actually need to address more properly going into a more sustainable society. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to talk because I often get the question, what packaging do you do you prefer and not? And I say like packaging that protects something that is important for humans to survive, that those are good packages, but packages that protect something that we don't need, or actually some of the products that even you can say make us sick, like, like watery or water with sugar into it, that's, that is for me an unnecessary packaging because it's product that you really can question. It's both that we, the product themselves uh, are not very valuable. They might even make us sick. And we need to question more like, what should we protect and what should we have in our retailer, in our stores and what should we try to use less of? Okay. Marcia, do you want to comment on that uh, one? The only thing I would add to that is, is that um, portion sizes here is absolutely critical because there are, there, you know, there, there are foodstuffs out there which in, in moderation are perfectly fine as part of a healthy diet, but making sure you get the portion sizes right. And one thing you have seen is a, a big shift, uh, particularly in the, um, uh, in the confectionery area to much smaller portion size. And of course that has a knock-on effect because that can increase, well, does increase the packaging per unit product. Um, but, you know, the, the critical thing I think we should be doing as a food system is actually making a food system that keeps us healthy and allows us to live, uh, uh, live longer. And, yeah, that's the key bit of a food system. So, so one of the questions addresses this one, and, and it's like, what real incentives do retailers have to provide more appropriate pack sizes and uh, portioning to consumers? Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Um, actually, that's a very good that's a very good question because that's something that we've um, we've done trying to link our love food hate waste campaign with the court all commitment. So thereby actually having, because one of the things the Cordell Commitment is about is actually reducing food loss and waste right across the supply chain. So that includes the home. And so what you're trying to do there is encourage changes, um, not only that reduce food waste in the supply chain and back of store, but also in the home and portion sizes is one way to do that. And actually helping people, I mean, there are things like eat me, freeze me packs, which are, which are quite good at allowing people to select the amount of food they actually need for a healthy, um, for a healthy meal. Um, but also thinking carefully about portion sizes and what is deemed to be a portion is something that can also help in that space. And of course, it's, it's because we have today costs in the system, like Richard said, with all the hidden costs of the food waste that we don't see above the surface. And we, to try to find business models where, where, where we make sure that the food waste is accounted for. And of course, it is a problem that so much is wasted at consumer because all of the system, they lose. You can think if the consumer don't waste the 20 percent that means that all of the system will sell 20 percent less in the future and to make that an attractive um, uh, business model to make sure that we can sell the correct amount to the consumer that they appreciate because the consumers actually don't want to waste food so it's like we think the business model how can we make sure that we support with the the food that they that they need and not support them with as much as possible, which has been the strategy for a long time. How can we sell, sell them more than they need, like take, take three and only pay for two in those systems? Those are outdated and not part of a sustainable society in the future. To, yeah. So we need to try out more things and um, yeah. yeah, and the yeah, business, yeah. And if I just might add to that, I mean, that buy one, get one free example that Helen just uses a key one. Um, you know, when Call Told started back in the back in about 2005, 2006, um, 2007, there were you could go into major supermarkets and, and get buy one, get one free on perishable items, which are really, really hard for the for, you have to be very, very focused on food waste reduction to make full use of that. Now you won't see that. Um, it's gone. 
Um, you, yeah, you'll see buy one, get one free on um, in, in the UK. You'll get buy one, get one freeze that actually are on non-perishables. That's fine. But on perishables, it's now you get half price offers or you get special price for uh, combinations of things. And that's just part of that solution. And just to build on Helen's point about, you know, if we're reducing food waste, does that mean we have to reduce production? And that's one of the reasons I was saying, well, actually reducing food loss and waste is actually one of the ways that we can feed the increasing population that we're seeing yeah, around the world. And that's quite a significant increase. I mean, some have suggested we might need to increase food production by 50% to, in, to feed the global population, given the dietary trends we're seeing. You know, actually, if we can reduce food loss and waste and re drastically reduce that, that's got to be a win for the environment. Great, great. Um, just uh, two, uh, two final questions and then we uh, round up. Um, I've got one question which is open uh, already quite some time, uh, as, uh, and it's about uh, your comments on PET packaging for beverages and recent growing ban across the world. Um, can you answer on, uh, are there any alternatives to, uh, to PET bottles? Uh, for example, Coca-Cola is using an alumin aluminium can for water in the USA. Uh, do, do you have any comments on that? it's it's tr it's tricky it is really and uh, uh, from a swedish context we consume about 100 liters per capita of water and uh, sodas every year and for me and, and i mean in those system the packaging and the transport are the two uh, large environmental impacts the the areas where we have uh, uh, environmental impact and I, I don't see a system where we, yeah, for some products we need uh, f to cut the consumption. And then of course there are other areas in the world where it's difficult to get a, a safe water. And there we need some packaging perhaps to provide to make sure that they get uh, water that is not contaminated. And there, yeah, it's perhaps PET bottles in some countries. and. Aluminium perhaps is better in other contexts, depending on the recycling yeah. system and yeah. yeah. And if I just add to that, I think particularly in um, countries where water is, is safe, the, the reuse option is something that we've seen a massive increase in. You know, you now can easily download an app to your phone, which will tell you where you can refill your bottle of water for free, um, which I think is a really good thing for so many levels, not least um, health, uh, health levels. Um, but it, the other thing is, is that it comes back to Helen's point earlier on. If we are thinking about, um, you know, an, an optimal solution, we need to think about recycling if we are going for a, a packaging, we're thinking about recycling and hardwiring that recycling in from the very beginning to keep down the environmental impact. This is why the Plastics Pact has got this target of increasing the recycled content up to 30%, as well as increasing the recycling rate. Because for where we want to use plastic packaging, where that makes environmental sense, we want to make sure we're creating a circular economy in those plastics. So the material goes round and round and round in a safe way, and it's not ending up in the sea. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, probably a challenge, especially with food packaging and health standards, I can presume. Um, okay, very good. Uh, final question I have on my screen is, that, uh, is from Beth uh, Gingold, and she uh, he, the, the question is, is there a standard protocol that companies can use to target, measure, and act that addresses both food loss and waste and packaging? Uh, for example, uh, WRI uh, food loss and waste protocol includes measuring food loss and food waste, but doesn't include measuring packaging. Yeah. Yeah, I can answer that. And the answer is, yeah, she's dead right. I mean, uh, RAP helped uh, work with WRI on and others like the UN Environment and um, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, to develop the uh, food loss and waste standard, which is exactly what it says. It's about uh, measuring food loss and waste right down the supply chain um, and reporting it in a common way in line with SDG 12.3, halving food loss and waste across the supply chain. Um, unfortunately, there isn't as yet um, a standard that does both, as far as I'm aware unless Helen knows different, but that, there isn't one that does both. I do think what's come out of this discussion, and it is a debate that I've come across in many conferences over the last year, is this idea that we're trying to optimize 
the food system, reduce its impact um, and get the minimum environmental impact to get the food to us in a safe way. And clearly doing food waste reduction is a critical part of that. And so is optimizing packaging. But as yet, that's not being brought together to my knowledge. No. There are some options out there with initiatives about how to view both uh, food waste and, and packaging and packaging waste, but they are not coherent yet, in my opinion. There are initiatives and ways, but, but I think the main thing that we need to focus more on is the, is the thinking. It, of course, we need to have the how to do it, that's important, but it's more like thinking in this holistic perspective where we talk and see talk about it and realize we need to have more things uh, to, to figure out and not just focus on one thing the whole time because now everybody talks about plastic yeah but we need to see this at the same time and that is such a difficulty with the more of a holistic perspective but that is where we then have to find how can this be summarized and make it a little bit easier to do the holistic um, progression and design initiatives. And I, yeah, there are initiatives coming out, I think, in that area, but it is complex. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, the, the whole, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the role and the functions of packaging and food waste, it seems quite obvious, but uh, once you get into the, the detail, the, well, the devil is always in the detail, so then it becomes complex, I presume. Um, well, we're coming to an end. Um, well, first of you, Helen and Richard, I would like to thank you very much for your time and sharing your expertise. Uh, very, very, very thank you to you. Thank uh, you for organizing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's been a real pleasure from my side and thank you for organizing as well. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, well, the audience, thank you for your attention and your questions. We try to address them as, as best as possible, um, but we're running out of time now. Um, be way, be ways wise. Thank you for hosting this webinar and this series. And uh, I understand it will be all online available as a replay to you or to share it with your friends. Uh, and I will share some of the key messages also through uh, beyondfoodwaste.com, uh, which is a blog which uh, I run together with Kate Heinrich from Australia, and where, where we share best practices about food waste around the world. So uh, I would like to encourage you to take a look there as well. And thank you. Um, Sweeta, do you want to do some final comments? Yep. Thank, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Helen, and thank you, Richard. It was a very interesting discussion. And thanks to all the participants for, uh, for actually, I mean, for making this a very interactive session. There were quite a few questions. It was absolutely great. Uh, thanks a lot for this great panel. And for those who are watching it, we still have a few more panels before we close 2019. It will be up on our website. So please subscribe, subscribe to our newsletter and you will get information the moment uh, new panel, I mean, the moment we plan another panel. So yes, thanks a lot. and. Uh, Bye-bye, wherever you are. Have a good day or good evening, whatever is left of it. Bye. Bye-bye.